Abandoned vessels have been plaguing our coastline for decades. The federal government has announced a $7 million fund to deal with them, but does it go far enough? There is also a federal standing committee on the status of women. What does it do and who's on it? We'll find out about that and a lot more on today's Upfront. My guest today is NDP MP for Nanaimo Ladysmith, Sheila Malcolmson. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Annette. Now, derelict vessels, abandoned vessels, I call them derelict, and you were saying earlier you like to call them abandoned vessels, but usually the derelict vessels end up being those abandoned vessels. They have been plaguing our coast in all of our communities, our bays from Sydney all the way up the coast um, to Port Hardy, and they have become such an issue that our harbour authorities have tried to figure out what to do with them. Nobody had responsibility. So the federal government this May announces that there's almost a $7 million fund to deal with them. But in your words and your reaction to it, having championed this cause for such a long time, you've said it doesn't do enough. Now explain that to me a bit more. Credit where credit's due, coastal governments and coastal communities have been pushing so long, 15 or more years, Union and BC municipalities passing resolutions. All of us, when I was in local government lobbying, the provincial minister of forest land and natural resources, uh, the fact that this is on the federal agenda at all is a credit to the tenacity of those coastal leaders. And I've been glad to be pushing with them. That said, they've announced $300,000 this year and for the four years following a million dollars a year. And that's for the whole country. And Transport Canada says there are thousands of abandoned vessels on Canada's three coasts. And we know last year when we finally got the Vicky Lynn 2 removed from Ladysmith Harbour, that had a $1.2 million price tag. So a million dollars a year we spent on one boat alone. So it's a tiny little start and it's going to get a few vessels gone, but a million dollars a year for removals is just a drop in the bucket, honestly. And I know that looking into the way it was working, they said that there is an application process that they have to go through. So you fill out an application to see if you can get approval or if it is going to be an issue or is there an immediate danger to have that vessel removed. And then it has to be studied and then they decide if it's going to be a one-year program or if it's going to fund for multiple years, which I found interesting. But as you said, a million dollars, you said 300000 for this year. I thought it was a million each year. And now uh, I think they were saying forty or $50,000 to take those three out of Couch and Bay a few weeks ago by private enterprise. And they all have a timeline they have to be taken out by. But if you travel anywhere, you'll see, you know, five, six, seven, eight, some communities even more. Like you, you can barely get through those waterways because of those boats. So what can be done or what is going to be done? Are you continuing with that effort to try and get them to step it up? I've proposed legislation in Parliament that's going to get debated this fall. And if the government doesn't have their own solution in place by then, a comprehensive solution, then I hope that they'll vote yes to my bill. It builds on the work of Jean Crowder in the previous Parliament. And what she focused on was identifying one federal ministry that is the starting point of responsibility. Right now, if you as a boater phone in an abandoned vessel, if it's leaking oil, you're supposed to phone one department. If it's a hazard to navigation, you phone another. If it's landed on the beach, then you phone the province. And we just heard again and again from ratepayers groups, from local governments, they get the runaround. And every federal department says, it's them, it's them, it's them. Now recently, the good men and women of Coast Guard have really been taking their own initiative and they've been dealing with those emergency boats that are at risk to spill oil, especially when they're close to, say, an aquaculture operation where even the smallest bit of oil spilled might result in a forced closure for health and safety reasons. That might put, in Ladysmith, we heard 30 people out of, out of work if just the smallest oil spill happens. So, so there is an ad hoc, you know, kind of off the side of their desk, both Transport Canada and Coast Guard, or off the side of their boat, you know, but they're not resourced. They don't have the clear lines of authority. So that's one piece that my legislation would fix. And, and the feds should want to do that too, because getting the runaround isn't helping. Well, I know from de researching for decades, because I, I took a year of research for this because I was writing an article about it. But I think this, the problem, in my opinion, stems from going back to way back, starting with when that person buys that boat which leads to a huge part of that issue. So as far as, you know, who is responsible for that vessel? I can sell a boat to you 
and then you could sell it to somebody, you can sell it to somebody. And you're supposed to register it, but it's not really enforced. So you end up with trying to figure out who that's traced back to. It's like, well, I sold that boat, it's not my problem. Is that still the case? Yeah. That is absolutely still the case and it's getting worse. The vessel registration system has really been in terrible disrepair the last 10 years. And that's partly what my legislation, another element of what we're trying to fix as well, to say you have to um, rehabilitate the vessel registration system. And ideally we do what Washington State did, was you take the money associated with vessel registration, even you know, if it's a small amount per vessel, but it goes into a fund that allows the state to then act on an emergency basis. But absolutely it has to be enforced. We've been hearing from marina operators that they see there's a direct reward to people that avoid registering their vessel. It allows them to avoid paying sales tax. So we've got a broken system. Um, I was really pleased to see the BC New Democrats in the election campaign say that they would take on uh, vessel registration the same way that the province does vehicle registration if the feds wanted to pass that down to provincial governments. And talking with some of the local police that do marine issues, they said they thought that that would really work a lot better than having it done out of Ottawa. The same way that if someone abandons a car or, or, if, some, or if someone um, doesn't actually register a change in ownership, they can't get insurance on that car. So why not do the same thing for vessels? Washington and Oregon did this ages ago. Most countries in the world who are maritime countries, the way that Canada is, they don't have this problem with abandoned vessels. So we should look to those best practices. And that's partly what my legislation is trying to do. It'd be nice to see some changes on that moving forward, but it's, it's frustrating that it's taken, you know, 15, 20 years for someone to say, admit or respond to that there is a crisis situation in this country because of what it does to the environment. I mean, it's attractive to live on a boat and it's affordable to live on a boat. And then why wouldn't you want to if you could? It's a camper on water, but they're, you know, the same thing. It's like, if you're not looking after it, eventually it sinks and then you're stuck. And then you can't force these people out because rules say there's mariners have access to safe harbor. You end up staying there for a while. And that brings to another issue is looking at, okay, if you're having to look at living on board a boat because it's, it's effective cost-wise for you, affordable housing, is that something that you're concerned about also, Sheila? We're hearing this from local governments across the whole country and we see it very clearly in Nanaimo. We've got the Nanaimo um, Aboriginal Centre is just starting up new construction on affordable housing uh, on Bowen Road. Great to see that going up. That's the first multifamily affordable housing that's been built in Nanaimo since the early 90s. And we know how much housing interferes with success, whether that's kids having a good place to do their homework, whether it's women leaving a situation of domestic violence and needing a safe place for their children and themselves to be able to go to, whether it's um, people you know, incubating a small business and needing a reliable, affordable housing, whether it's people uh, facing homelessness because of economic peril, people with addictions or leaving jail that need a good place to land and how much better they can do in society if they've got a good roof over their head. And across the whole country, uh, federal and provincial governments have, have let the investment in affordable housing fall into real disrepair. So we're glad to see federal announcements on affordable housing. We're discouraged that rather than front end loading that investment, because I think to a lot of us in the community, this feels like exactly the kind of you know, infrastructure investment that we need more than anything. That the money has been delayed in flowing to local governments and, and local partners like Habitat for Humanity and other good providers. And a lot of it is announced to be spent after the next federal election, which is kind of um, a bit arrogant to me to presume that the government is going to get reelected and that they'll deliver on their promise, you know, seven years down the road. We need it now. Does it have to be a federally supported or provincially supported or municipally supported initiative? Uh, is it the responsibility of the federal government to, to lay down some kind of a rule that says that the municipalities or the cities have to try and encourage those affordable housing? We look at what's happening. I know it's not here in Nanaimo, but it could come here just quickly, is with the foreign buyers in those homes and the marketing of these townhouses or apartments to foreign countries before they're marketed here. And I hear rumors that that may be happening, like say already on the island, where those sales are going up somewhere else because it's a higher profit margin. So, but who's responsible for legislating that or is that a fair market option? 
There are a lot of layers to the story. Um, there are certainly municipalities, for example, Whistler, which was because of they couldn't find employee housing that they did choose as a municipality to regulate. Um, you know, if, if you're, you know, you have to have a head on the pillow is basically it. The, the landowner would pay a higher tax if they had a house that was empty most of the time because of foreign ownership. Um, to me, the biggest thing that we can do at a senior government level is recognize affordable housing that has got some form of, of rent control or tying the space to people's income. Um, the market will do what it will at the high end, but if we can make some more space for people at the lower income, and then that takes pressure off every part, every strata um, of, of people within the community. It helps with homelessness. If people can, can purchase a home or can rent in a, a long-term reliable way, a home that they can afford, um, people that, you know, and in many cases have two working partners in the family, but they still are having a hard time getting by, that suggests that we need to see provincial and federal leadership to encourage the construction industry to build more of those units, but not have them be completely speculative. It's always going to be a mix, and that's what we're aiming for. It's, it's a tough challenge because who says that I can't invest a million dollars and build a, a four-story condo, and I want to get the highest value for my dollar, and yet I am forced to have to rent. To, to basically affordable housing for people so they can live in the communities. I have five kids, they can't afford to buy a house kind of thing. So I understand that, but at the same time, it's like, well, what's, where's, what's, you know, what does the market allow for and why are you restricting my profit margin, et cetera? But at the same time, we need to look after our own. Well, that's where often these um, affordable housing units are built in partnership, that the city um, gives the land, that Habitat for Humanity works with students at Vancouver Island University, you know, whereas in the past they might have been to get their carpentry ticket, they would be building a fake house and then dismantling it. Now they get to actually work with a, a great frontline uh, nonprofit like Habitat and, um, and see themselves, you know, the pride of those students to have work together to build a house that is a forever home for a lower income family and to give them that stability. So th that's an example of a win-win-win for the students, the community, for the family. And th that's how I think we're going to, you know, it, with real diversity, um, tackle this affordable housing problem. Now you mentioned it because you talked about it before and, on, and looking at how to help women who have had to flee mm -hmm. or whatever and get a different start. That brings me to the a committee that you chair as the Federal Standing Committee on Women. And you know, people go, well, what is the Federal Standing Committee on Women? Who's on that? What does it do and how effective is it? So there's a lot of things to cover on that. So you are the chair of that standing committee now? I'm the vice chair. Vice chair, okay. I'm one of the two vice chairs. There's a conservative chair and liberal and new democrat vice chairs. What is the yeah. committee? Yeah. Like um, many elements of parliament, there are standing committees that are established uh, to review legislation, to dive into issues. There's a fisheries committee, there's an immigration committee. This is a, a committee on, on status of women, women's equality. I initiated a study that the other members agreed to on women's place in the economy. Why do women tend to make less? Why, do they, why are they more likely to retire in poverty? Are there barriers that we can look at as a federal government that would help um, even out that economic discrepancy? So we've been hearing witnesses from across the country for four months now, and we'll return to it actually in October once parliament reconvenes, or in September. Uh, just last week, we had from Nanaimo the Multicultural Society, we had Haven Society, I and mean, the Island Crisis Care Society. Um, some of them came in by video conference, but some of them were funded um, to come and, and, and testify in person. Well, they told us personal stories about brave women who have left dangerous situations. They told us about the impediments that immigrant women face when they can't get access to language training, which makes them have, of course, a very much harder time getting, um, getting a good job. Or if they can't speak the language, maybe they get pressed more into precarious work that may not be as safe for them. Um, and we heard about the lack of funding that is uh, putting pressure on Samaritan House and other just great projects in the community that have had support from business, from volunteers. We need that federal government partnership to help them be able to keep their doors open and be able to accommodate the increasing 
number of people that are coming looking for help in, in just really very sad circumstance. And, and I would imagine that these types of facilities or organizations exist right across the country. We're familiar right. with what's here, what Haven does, mm -hmm. and try to support those. What was the reaction with those presentations that were made to that standing committee? Did it open some eyes? Did it basically bring to the forefront these issues that the women are facing? I think it had a very important impact to be able to remind people that um, all of these social justice issues are in the end economic issues. If, uh, if a woman facing domestic violence has, it has to leave her job to get that extra couple of weeks to rent a new apartment and to settle her kids and make sure that the kids are safe, um, well, that puts her in the place of, of being um, in economic peril, and it also removes her from some of her support system. We've heard testimony from uh, women in the labor movement who have negotiated uh, a domestic leave, a domestic violence leave associated with their collective agreements. And in fact, in British Columbia, um, the NDP in opposition brought forward a private member's bill to say, we should have this as part of the labor code. Same as if someone gets sick or a, or a parent is um, in palliative care, you can get leave from work. You should be able to get it for domestic violence as well. But what was especially, I think, impactful was to remind the other members of the committee that, um, that these, these social problems have direct economic consequences and women can stand on their own feet better economically if we have a social safety net that protects them in the, the terrible times, you know, the, the family illness, um, uh, dislocation because of having to leave your country as a refugee. Um, and then we've also heard a lot of encouragement from every witness across the country um, that if we had affordable universal childcare, that women also would have more money to spend in the local economy and they would be able to get access to, to better jobs if they weren't having to leave the job market in order to look after children. No. So what is the end goal of that economic impact study? Where is it going to go? What's, is there something that's going to be tabled at that yeah. point? Okay. Yeah. So we'll um, come together as committee members. We'll hash out all the recommendations that we've heard from all the witnesses. This will probably start to happen in October. Um, and then we really get to find out which uh, members really were compelled by the testimony, which ones uh, think it needs more study, which ones are just like, no, we just don't want to go there at all. And we've done this already on two different studies for, um, for this same committee. Um, if we can't get consensus in what we'll present to Parliament, then as individual parties, we can also present a minority report. So no matter what the advice from each of the members comes to Parliament, the government then gives a written response, and we hope that our advice will, will influence policy. And we certainly know that the uh, women's organizations and the social justice groups from across the country, uh, those running domestic violence shelters, any of it, um, that they get to see their own work and advice advanced directly to the prime minister in a way that they might not otherwise. It's good profile. Has, I know we want other topics to talk about, but just very quickly, Sheila, is, has there been something that has been enacted because of that federal standing committee? Has there been things that have changed because of it? Yeah. We've. Um, not yet, which is a bit discouraging. Um, we've had the government agree in general terms of the direction, but they haven't actually brought, come forward and tabled the legislation that we've asked for. So they're doing a little bit at this point of saying, trust us, we're the good guys, and we're a feminist government. And what we're trying to say is, well, you might not always be in power, and I know you've got good intentions, but unless you actually lock it in in legislation, it won't be binding on future governments. Um, one thing we did see, though, that was neat was uh, we did a study on um, cyber bullying and cyber violence, especially aimed at young women and girls. And as a result of us bringing Facebook in um, to be witnesses to our committee, they changed some of their policies around um, around calling out people that were, were perceived as, as bullying online. That just happened a couple of months ago. So even though that wasn't a government change, it was a corporate change that we saw directly tied to our work. Oh, very good, very good. Now, I, I know you've also been championing the cause for the electoral reform and pushing it forward. Canadians mm -hmm. wanted something to change. What's happening with that? Yeah. Government says it's dead, which we're so surprised at because it was I mean, in Nanaimo, Lady Smith, and I think all of Vancouver Island, I think people had a particular uh, passion. We heard about it at a lot of the all candidates meetings in the federal election. 
because British Columbia has gone through two referenda, I think that maybe the general population has got more awareness about the issue. Um, and certainly it was a major promise. Well, the NDP made the promise, but, but it was a major promise for uh, Justin Trudeau. And uh, to say we're, we're going to do things differently and, and this will be the last election under first past the post was a very strong commitment. And so we were all pretty stunned in January when he pulled the plug on it in a very strong way. He didn't even just say, we're going to kind of study this a little more or we'll, we'll get back to you. He said, it's done. We uh, then had my colleague Nathan Cullen brought to Parliament a vote uh, to say, let's look back at the, at the committee recommendation. This committee heard from um, thousands of witnesses across the country, got really the best advice from people in academia and other examples from other governments that elect their, their parliaments in a more every vote counts way. And, um, but again, the Liberals voted against that motion. So I'm not sure how we're going to keep it alive in this parliament, but we certainly, I continue to get tons of mail from people. Uh, Fair Vote and Lead Now are both groups that are out still waving the banner. Nanaimo, Fair Vote's got a very active chapter and lots of students up at VIU. Uh, the university, we continue to hear a demand for electing our parliaments in a way that better makes the parliament reflect the diversity of our community. And so that's still a hope. Most Western countries have already gone in this direction. We're a bit of an anomaly that we're still using first past the post, a majoritarian system rather than a cooperative system. And I think again for BC, looking at the prospect, fingers crossed that we will have a provincial government that's a cooperative government with the NDP and Greens. We may be able to see the value of some of those. What happens when different political parties come together, find what are the areas of, of common interest for the common good, for the public good, and to give people some reassurance that we can do better in, in governments where, where different political parties have to, have to put their differences aside and work together. And that's what a, a, a democratic reform move around proportional representation would, would result in. There's probably not much time left in this half hour, but I just want to give you a chance, Sheila, that is, is there, we've talked about issues that you've been concerned with, you've been championing. Are there other things on the agenda for you? I know it's summer break, but what are you working on? Yeah. Well, we still have a real concern on the BC coast about what's going to happen with the Kinder Morgan pipeline. For us, it's all downside, no upside. There are no jobs that result from this project and the risk to existing maritime jobs is, is extreme in the event of an oil spill and spilling a kind of oil that there's still no technology proven to be able to clean it up because that's a sticky, unrefined product. So that is, I'm sure, being out on the water and, uh, and, and talking with people that are fishing and doing tourism, um, that will continue to hear a real urgency around the imperative to, to stop this project. And, and at the same time, an imperative to build up our marine social safety net, which has been undermined. Um, over the last 10 years and to make sure that we've got the best on water oil spill response. I think there's just an increased vigilance. And we've also got a real imperative around indigenous reconciliation, which does fit in. We're seeing very strong leadership um, right in the riding here, Saminas, Nanas and Sanemo, all uh, very strong leadership who are all saying, let's turn the good words and the commitment to reconciliation that the federal government has um, into action. So we see changes on the ground. Um, Let's talk more action. That's a theme. I should ask, uh, ask you at the same time too, because it has been an issue, is about mm -hmm. the freighters, the anchorages that were mm -hmm. potentially could occur on the on the coast of yeah. Gabriel Island. Mm -hmm. Where is that at? I haven't heard anything. I'm on the mailing list. I don't know the status of that. Mm -hmm. Is it possibly going to go ahead or is that still a fight? It's still a fight. Um, I was up in Parliament just last week uh, debating the um, Minister of Transport's uh, representative. You know. Why is this still in play? Where is it in the process? Who gets to say yes or no? What are the assurances uh, to the community that they'll be able to be involved in the decision? And it's a very murky area. And at the same time, we're seeing headlines in the report on business section about shipping volumes dropping and, um, and a real uh, insecurity around what the shipping industry um, across the Pacific looks like. These aren't local products that are being, um, that are being shipped in and out. This isn't, a, again, this is not a local jobs issue 
and the anchorages proposed off Gabriola are to export coal from Wyoming um, to burn in power plants in China. So it's a climate change problem, it's a local risk problem, and there are no jobs and, and no Canadian products exported. So this feels like a lose-lose-lose proposition, and we're continuing to push uh, Transport Canada and Minister Garneau to, to pull the project entirely so that the community can go back to having a summer and not just always fighting bad projects like this and all the time. what the status is going to be of their right. homes and what's going to be existing out there. Um, and like I said, there's there's not always all sides being told in it either mm -hmm. as, as far as you, you said something to me, I was not sure, I've not confirmed mm -hmm. that it was not ships for local products. It, they kept saying it's for all tankers as opposed to just for coal, but yeah. interesting. So Well, that was the, init that was the initial proposal. They. Um, said that we don't have enough berths for these coal ships. They've, they've since said that it might be expanded. But no matter what, this is import-export um, overseas. This is, this is not Canadian wooden furniture, unfortunately, that's, mm -hmm. that's leaving our, our communities. Um, and so, so it's all, again, it's, the risk is high for us, um, and, and we have not been able to point to a single local benefit. All right, people want to get in touch with you now that you are back, and I know you do deserve some time off, but you're going to have people knocking on your door. They want to talk to you about an issue. They want to have some direction from you. Are you accessible enough to that? Yeah, absolutely. I've got three great staff people working in my office who are always available for people's questions and comments. They are um, great, whether it's a problem with the, um, Revenue Canada or immigration. Those are probably the two biggest ones. I rely enormously on my local team. So what we'll do is work through the system, try to help uh, people um, in the community get access to the federal programs that they need. Um, and then at the point that we need to elevate it to a ministerial level, that's where I get involved. So people are in good hands if they get in touch with my office, uh, 734-6400. Um, my email, Sheila, uh, dot malcolmson at parl.gc.ca and then out in the community if people have got ideas suggestions feedback on federal policy issues then i'm all ears and this is one of the things i'm looking forward to more than anything being home is making sure i'm just really rooted in the community and and hearing from people on the front lines how i can best support them Thank you very much for joining us today. Sheila Malcolmson, our Nanaimo Ladysmith NDP MP on Upfront. And we'll be back again with another leader on our next show. Thanks for joining us today.